Good morning, once again, good morning everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So welcome and thank you so much to the Credit to the Thailand National Statistical Office. Thank you very much to uh, the Thailand Line Ministries and offices for joining us today. The participants from Kyrgyzstan and the Maldives, the Asian Development Bank and this stuff. I think I didn't forget anyone. Yeah, I forgot you in this thing, but I did from you in this I don't have to open this. So once again, thanks so much for joining us here. Um, I have already talked about this and dealt uh, with Stefan and Stefan about this workshop um, during the opening. Um, once again, this is an advanced workshop. We already have the basic knowledge of SDMX, but today we will refresh our knowledge. Today we will cover the stuff, mostly for today we will cover the stuff that you already know. And then tonight and tomorrow and Wednesday uh, we'll be doing more exciting. We'll be doing more exciting things which we haven't seen. So this presentation you probably, I mean you might have seen that uh, from previous workshops, but it's always good to refresh your knowledge. So I'll be doing the presentation anytime you can stop me and ask a question. So if you need uh, to ask a question, please don't hesitate to stop. And uh, have you received, I mean, I think the presentations also have been translated. Have you have received the translation? The Thai participants? Okay, the presentations have been translated into Thai. So if you haven't received the presentation in the Thai language, then uh, you can, uh, you, you will receive them. And sorry, the Maldives and Kyrgyzstan, you will have to use the English. Okay, so let's go. So, we're talking about data exchange standards. And let's talk about what data is in the first place. If you have a number, like 2529, what is it? We don't know. It can be anything. Right? It can be a year according to the Thai calendar. It can be a year according to the Gregorian calendar, so we're talking about 500 years from now. It could be pretty much anything else. If we just have a figure by itself, a standalone number, it's meaningless, we don't know what it is, and in order to understand it, we need to describe it. And so gradually you can see the properties of this number appear. So now it tells us that this is related to a number of tourist establishments in Italy. Let's see what else we can find here. Aha. Uh -huh. So now we know what it is. 2,529 is the number of tourist campsites in Italy in the year 2004, and that's the annual number. So, in order to make use, in order to understand and make use of the data, the data needs to be properly described. And uh, then the descriptions that people users, us, and those who use our data, they let us, know, uh, they let us understand what these figures are. So, in order to understand, in order to exchange the data, to develop a common understanding, we need a data model. And a data model is to provide descriptions for all relevant characteristics of data to be exchanged. exchanged. And the keyword here is relevant. Okay? Why? It's because potentially there is, there is an infinite number of characteristics that are relevant to the data. Um, 
when you change the data, you need to focus on relevant characteristics. In some ways, in many ways, but not always, um, developing a data model is similar to uh, developing a relational database. Who here has developed a relational database ever? Microsoft Access, SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, who has developed a database? Raise your hand, don't be shy, please. Okay, so quite a few people. So, um, if you have developed or even worked with a relational database, then you will find many things familiar. Um, okay, who has used Microsoft Access? Well, um, if you have used Microsoft Access, then you know that when you double click and open it, what do you see? You see nothing. Right? Before you can do anything with Microsoft Access, you need to do what? You need to create a database. Or in other words, you need to create a database structure. That's the first step. If you don't have a database structure, there's nothing you can do with Access. It's different in that sense from Excel, for example, or from Word. With Excel, you can just open a blank um, worksheet blank spreadsheet and start populating it with the data. Start typing the data in. With Microsoft Access it's different. Before you can start working with data, you need to create a structure. So in as the in when you uh, and same thing with SQL Server for example or Oracle or MySQL or Sybase if they're old enough people like me to remember what that is. Before you start, before you can do anything with your database management system, you need to create a database. Before you can do anything with SDMX, you need a data structure definition, which is the equivalent of a database structure. Whenever you work with SDMX, you need a DSD. Either you create one yourself, or you use a DSD that someone has created for you. So, if you look at um, an SDMX data structure definition, it's kind of similar to a so-called star schema, which is used in database uh, design. Star schema, to, recall, to remind, is basically you have a single fact table and multiple auxiliary tables that describe your case of the fact So, how do we create a DSD? What do we need to create a DSD? The first step is to find concepts, identify and discover data. What is the concept? Unit of thought created by a unique combination of characteristics. Basically, a concept. <laughs> so, um, a concept is either a characteristic or a combination of characteristics about the data. Um, What concept can you think of when we think about a person like myself? What concepts are applicable to myself? Well, I'm a man, right? So how about sex? That's one concept which is applicable to every person. What about age? I won't tell you, but I have an age. What about height? What about weight, uh, marital status, highest level of education? These are all um, concepts, characteristics. 
And when we talk about statistical data, uh, we will use very similar uh, concept. And a concept, ideally, concept should describe only one characteristic about the data. Sex, man. But sometimes, a concept can describe, depending on the structure of your data, data on decisions that you make, a concept can describe more than one characteristic. For example, married with children. Right? So that's two characteristics. One is the marital status, and the other is um, um, whether or not the person has children, and so on. So ideally, when you can, you should be curious, and you should have each concept describe only one characteristic. But sometimes, because of the complexity of this exchange, you are forced into having councils which combine several characteristics together. Any questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. All right. So what you're looking at is, um, actually this is an, expert, an excerpt from the African Statistical Yearbook. We have a statistical table. So remember how we had the number of tourist campsites in Italy. It was also a statistical table. So we had we had a number, 25, 29, and we didn't know what that number was until the characteristics were shown. So let's pick a number. What concepts do you think are applicable to this number? What concepts can be extracted from this table? What concepts can you see in this table? Pick up, Nagisa. Indicator. Total mid-year population. That's your indicator. What is this number in the first place? What does it represent? That's total mid-year population. What else? Please speak up. Don't 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 stay silent. Country or reference area. Enough, Give the others a chance. <laughs> yes, indicator what we have. Reference area, country or territory or province in the SDMX world, as well as actually in the larger statistical world, it, it refers to, uh, I mean, it's, the, the concept name is reference area. What are this? Time period. Beautiful, fantastic. Notice. You may recall that we live in a four-dimensional universe with three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. What we have here is we have space and we have time. So we've ticked out all those dimensions. And we also have the indicator, which is what um, the number actually describes. So this is important. Space, time, and indicator are the equivalent. It's something you will find in practically any data structure definition. That's also the minimum number of uh, dimensions that you need for a data structure. OK, so we've had input from Kyrgyzstan and the Maldives. Thailand, what else do we have here? Unit. 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 With unit, with unit, it's a bit more tricky because in SDMX, um, unit comes in two concepts typically. There's unit of measure and there's unit multiplied. So 
the unit of measure for this table would actually be person. It's skipped here, it's not used, but it's implied because this is your unit, population or person. That's your unit of measure. But then you also have unit multiplier that tells you whether the number is in absolute units or thousands or millions and so forth. So yes, unit multiplier. And finally, we need a concept to carry the figure, them, the figure itself. And that concept is called observation value. So these are the concepts that we can extract from this table. So, now that we know what a concept is, let's go straight into SDMX. SDMX concept scheme. What is it? It's a set of concepts that are used in a data structure definition or metadata structure definition. Basically, um, concept scheme is simply a list of concepts. And why it's important to remember, why it's important to pay attention to the concept scheme, is that in SDMX, starting version 2.1, concepts don't live by themselves. They're not maintained by themselves. You cannot transmit a concept from one place to another. What you can transmit is a concept scheme. So concept by itself is not maintainable, but a concept scheme, which is a list of concepts, is maintainable, right? So concept schemes puts concept into a maintainable unit. So this is our small little concept scheme for uh, the table we just saw. Any question? Any questions? Please don't hesitate to interrupt. Now, there are different kinds of concepts, and the question we have here is, which of the concepts are used to identify an observation? Let's go back to the table. So I think we're talking about the figure 1787. Which concept do I need to know to find that observation? Any ideas? What do I need to know to find that number? It's not a trick question, it's not very difficult. Indicator, reference area, and time period. Thank you, Narkisa. Yes. We need to know, to when, once we know that the indicator is total media population, the country is Namibia, and the year is 2001, we have enough information to locate, to locate the observation. Okay? Who has ever been to a theater? like a cinema or a theater, see the show, Broadway musical, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, yeah? <laughs> so, um, when you go to a theater, it can be different, but when you go not to a cinema, but a proper theater for a, sh for a show, you get a ticket that says, row number, seat number, and sometimes also the section number. If you know your section, row, and seat numbers, then you can find your seat. You need to know all these three concepts to find your seat. Similarly here, you need to know indicator, reference area, and time period to find that observation. So, indicator, reference area, and time period, these concepts are called, you know, in, in our model, in our data model, these concepts identify observations. When we know all three, we can unambiguously locate an observation in the table. Unambiguously. If you tell me indicator, total media population, reference area, Namibia, 
time period 2001, then I will know exactly the one observation that is referred to. So such observations are called dimensions. Okay. And if you do have experience creating a relational database, the meaning of dimension is similar to a primary key field. If you have a composite primary key with several fields, dimension is one of those uh, primary key fields. Is this clear? Any questions? Please don't be shy. Please, if you, if you don't understand something, ask questions. Ask them now, because tomorrow it will be too late when we'll be covering the advanced stuff. So if there's something you don't understand, please ask them. Perfect. Everybody understands everything. Let's go. Now, let's go back to our series. Let's go back to our table. So I'm telling you, reference er uh, indicator, total mid-year population. Reference area in Namibia, time period 2001. What's the observation? Yes? 1787. So that means that in 2001, in Namibia, the population was 1,787 people, right? A little more than we have in this room. Is that correct? Why not? That's what it says. We have the observation. 1787, the population of Namibia in 2001 was 1,787, which is definitely less than what we have in this building. Is that correct? No. No, why not? How do we know that it's not? You need to use the multiplier. Unit multiplier, yes. Thousands. This is it. Unit multiplier, it doesn't help us find observations. It's not a dimension. Thousands, millions, billions, it doesn't help us find the population of the media. But it tells us something very important about this observation. It tells us that it's not 1.7 thousands that lived in Namibia in 2001, but 1.7 million people. So attributes, they, they um, carry additional, represent additional information about observations. Um, but they are not used to identify them. So, and if you have uh, developed a relational database, it's similar to a non-primary key field in the database. Any questions? No? Now, Observation value, that's a concept which is used to transmit the actual fit. And in SDMX, such a concept is called primary measure. Now, to be honest, I'm not sure why it's called primary measure, because in SDMX 2.1, there was only one measure, which is the primary measure. However, starting as DMX 3.0, we will have multiple measures. And this was done, this was implemented to support, uh, primarily to better support microdata. But not just microdata, you also have it in aggregate. So for the same um, set of dimensions, you can have more than one measure, more than one observations. Okay? Uh, we won't go into detail in SDMX 2.1, in all, in every global data structure definition, there's only one measure. It's called the primary measure. 
and primary measure is represented by constant or duration factor. Questions? No? So, when we design a data structure definition, we need to choose, we need to determine the role of a constant. And uh, it's not always easy. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. So, concepts that identify data, identify observations, they should be main dimensions. And concepts that provide additional information about data, they should be made attributes. What's important is that if you make a concept for dimension, then you can have time series which are different only in that concept. So for example, if you have unit of measure as a dimension, which many data structure definitions have, then you can use it to create time series, such as, for example, if we're talking about um, rice paddy yield or agricultural harvest. You can express it in tons or tons per hectare. So you can, you can express the absolute number and the rate. That's fine, and that's an unit of measure of is often is unit of measure is often used for that purpose. But then if you have kilograms and tons in your code list, you can also create time series for kilograms and tons. And that is not something you would typically do, because one is completely derivable from the other. Okay? But just keep that in mind. It doesn't mean that you know we, there is nothing you can do about this. You can use content constraints to ensure that either kilograms or tons are used. But this is something you can do. So let's have a look at our small little data set. We're looking at an MDG indicator, fixed and mobile telephone subscriptions. And the, what this data set tells us is that in 2012, there were 9.7 million fixed and mobile subscriptions in Cambodia. In 2013, that number rose to 20.6 million. And we also know that in 2013, there were 140.9 subscriptions per 100 population. Is this a valid data set? Yeah, this is about a data set. Let's see. Which concepts can you uh, identify in this data set? Sh Which concepts? Speak up, it's easy. What do you see on the table? Speak up. Reference area, in this case, Cambodia. What else? Indicator. 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 We have just one indicator here, fixed and mobile telephone subscription. What else? Time period, of course, 2013. We have space, we have time, we have indicator, and also the unit of measure, unit multiply. So let's see. But then, which, one of, well, which ones of them are dimensions and which are attributes? So let's have a look at this data structure and representation of the data set. So we identify reference area, indicator, time period, and unit as dimensions. And then we have attributes, unit multiplied, and observation value. All right, so what's wrong with this data set? What's the problem with this data set? in this data structure. There's a difference in the unit. Yes, there is a difference in the unit, but it's a dimension. So we have one time series, we have a second time series, less than one. OK, there's no problem. Well, let, let's cut this short. There is no problem with this data set. It's all fine. It's a valid. It's a structure which is a valid representation for this piece. 
So now the matches are underlined. So here we have reference area indicator, and unit, and unit as dimensions. And now let's have let's have a look at a very similar structure, but unit of measure is no longer a dimension; it's an attribute. So we have reference area indicator, time period. So we have reference area indicator and time period as uh, dimensions, unit, unit multiplier, and observation value as attributes. What is wrong with this one? No, it's okay. this data set? Somebody was starting to say something that we got interrupted. What is wrong? There is something wrong here. What is wrong? The same indicators, the same observation. Well, yes. Remember, dimensions help us identify or locate observation in a table. When we know all dimensions, then we can unambiguously locate an observation in a table. So in this case, we have all dimensions. Reference area Cambodia. Fixed and mobile telephone, uh, indicated fixed and mobile telephone subscriptions. Time period 2013. We have all the dimensions, and what we get is not one observation, but two. And that means that we have a what? We have a duplicate observation. And if we try to validate this data set, it would not pass validation. It would say, no, duplicate observation found. This data set is, in, this data set is invalid. Okay? These observations are different only in their attributes. But suppose that we still have that data structure and we need to use it. We can't change it for some reason. So then what can be done is we can introduce a second indicator. Fixed and mobile telephone subscriptions per 100 population. Now, there is, no, uh, there is no violation. Why? It's because each one of these has a distinct, unique combination of dimensions. So now, we don't have, um, we don't have that situation. All right, so my question to you, we've seen two data structures. One with four dimensions, including unit of measure. The other with three dimensions, not including the unit of measure. Which structure is correct? or valid for this. Huh? Which structure is correct? Anybody can venture a guess?
Okay. Yes? Which structure is correct? With unit of measure as dimension or an attribute? Which structure is correct? With unit of measure as a dimension or as an attribute? So the first one, with unit of measure as dimension. Yes? Okay, anyway, um, the thing is to ask which, is, which structure is correct is not quite correct, is not quite right. Both of these structures are correct because we have seen how we can represent the same data set using both structures. So the real question is not which structure is correct, but which structure is better. And the answer to that is, that depends. And especially when it comes to the unit of measure, it's a particularly difficult topic on which there is an ongoing debate in the SDMX community. I can tell you that in the macroeconomic statistics, uh, data structures like national accounts, balance of payments, foreign direct investments here, in all of them, unit of measure is a dimension. In the SDG data structure definition, unit of measure is an attribute. Which approach is better? Again, it's debatable. Any questions? Questions, questions, questions. No questions. Okay, great. And it's 10 30, so I think that we can have a break. Until what time? 15 minutes? Okay, so we have a 15 minute coffee break now. If you think of any questions during the coffee break, I will be happy to answer them after the break. So use this time wisely. Thanks very much. Please be here at 10 45 sharp. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to 
ต่อขนมไหมครับไม่เอาจ้ะเอาน้ำเพิ่มไหมไม่เอาจ้ะหรือเอาน้ำขวดไหมไม่เอาเลยเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวพี่เนี่ยเขียนโน้ตได้ต้องเปล่าไหมเดี๋ยวพี่เนี่ยเขียนโน้ตได้ต้องเปล่าไหมเดี๋ยวพี่เ
ุสมบัติเดี๋ยวเบ็ดDimensions are mandatory always. When you go to a theater, you need to know your section number, row number, seat number. If you don't have any one of these, you will never be able to find your seat. But attributes, they can be mandatory or conditional. In other words, optional. Um, the difference is that mandatory attributes must always be present, and if a mandatory attribute is missing, it's the same as a dimension missing that makes the data set invalid. Optional attributes, they may or may not be there. If an optional attribute is missing, that still makes for a valid data set. Now, let's think about concepts again. SDMX the SDMX Statistical Working Group, which is part of the SDMX governance, governance structure, develops and publishes cross-domain concepts. What are these? These are recomm con recommended to use concepts which apply to various uh, statistical subject matter domains. 
Um, let's have a look at them. These are all cross-domain concepts. They're names and IDs. Statistical indicator. Concept with ID indicates the reference area, sex, age, unit of measure, unit multiplier, and period observation value. When you are creating a data structure definition, you are, have identified your concepts. First thing you should do is have a look at the list of the cross-domain concepts and see if you can find a matching concept there. Please use these standard IDs. It's great for interoperability. Then if someone reads your data structure definition, they won't have to figure out which concept is what, is which. These are standard concept IDs and they should be used as much as possible. The only trick is that sometimes if you look at older DSDs or legacy DSDs, they may have their own concept IDs which are different from these because they were developed before uh, the cross domain concepts were published. And that's a common situation. <coughs> All right. So let's have a look at um, the data model for our statistical year. We have three dimensions, indicate the reference area time period. We have unit attribute, which is attached to the time series. It doesn't make sense to attach a unit, a unit multiplier in this case, the single observation, because it applies to the entire data set. But we attach it to the time series for convenience. And observation value, which is the same. Now, representation. If I tell you that my age is 48 kilograms, is that correct? No. That's right. Why not? Well, we have concepts and for each concept, you need to define a valid representation. That is, which values the concept can take. And when the, you are transmitting the data, each concept must have a valid value. Now, in SDMX, you can have three um, types of representation for a concept. You can have, a concept can be coded, can use a code from a code list. A concept can be formatted, that is uncoded but have a type attached to it. And a concept can be free text. So let's have a look at this. What is a code? A language independent set of letters, numbers, or symbols that represents a concept whose meaning is a in natural language. What is a code? It's a sequence of characters that can be associated with descriptions in any number of languages. And uh, these descriptions can be updated uh, without describing the languages. I think that we have all seen and used codes in our real life. Uh, my question to you is, why do you need codes? Speak up. To standardize the data set. Yes, uh, in principle, yes, but you can also say, you know what, I've never questioned myself why you need a code, it was so natural to me, until during the workshop here in Bangkok in 2013, when the first version of this workshop was presented, people started questioning me, why do we need codes in the first place? Why can't we use just the name? 
Why can why do we need clothes? Why can't we use names instead of clothes? Sometimes the names are a bit complicated. Yes, sometimes the names are complicated. That uh, it, it is true. It is difficult to ensure the um, correctness of names. They are pretty long. What, why else? The code can be the the beginning of the association of uh, definition. Just like one, two, three, four. Two yes. Somewhere it goes. Yes. There's one more thing. A question to everyone except Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. What is this? Yes, codes give you language independence. You can associate, you have a code which you can associate with a number of languages. You can have, this, is the, this name happens to be in Russian. You can also have one in English. You can have it in um, the Thai language, obviously. Um, in any other languages. But when you transmit the data, you don't transmit the name. You don't need to. You just transmit the code. And then the recipient is free to use any language which is associated, which, which is associated with that code. So that's the first um, major function performed by a code. A code list. Predefined list of codes where some statistical concepts take their values. Um, a code list is a collection of codes which is maintained as a unit. Um, now, this is the key. A code list enumerates all possible values. This is very important. Because it gives you a range, a domain restriction, a range of valid domain values. So if we look at examples, the first one, this is a partial list of uh, SDG series, Part, a partial list of education levels, a partial list of reference areas. Why is it important? It's because if I, if I transmit data that says sex equals 15 to 19 years, the system will know that this is not a valid value for sex. Why not? It's because it's not in the sex code list and the data set will be rejected. So these are the two major functions performed by code list. I mean, one is of the, um, or three. One is obviously they provide representation. Two is they provide language independence, and three is they provide um, a restriction on the main values. They enumerate all possible values that a concept can take. And if someone sends anything else, uh, it will be. Done. Any questions? No questions. Let's go. Cool. 
So code list can provide representation for concepts in terms of codes. Codes are language independent, as we talked about. When you create a data structure definition, you can provide um, the names for a code in any number of languages. And if you are designing a data structure for exchange, then obviously port list must be harmonized among all data providers that will be involved in data exchange. This is the trickiest part. This is the one that makes data exchange so difficult. And this is one that has nothing to do with SDMX and everything to do with how humans operate. Now, very often you use a code list to represent a concept in a data structure, but you don't have to. A concept can also be free text. That is, any valid value, any valid text can be used um, um, as a value for the concept. A good example of that is Kutman. Now, Sometimes people create uh, controlled vocabularies of footnote, which is supposed to be not quite footnotes. But typically, footnotes um, are transmitted as prefixes. You don't try to codify them. Uh, or other notes, various reference pieces of reference data. But you can also specify a format for for your concept. So for example, date type, you can specify the data, basically data type. It can be date time, or if, uh, if it's a postal code, it can be five digits, which is the case in the United States as well as Canada. Now, in SDMX, Dimensions must either use a code list or have their format or data type specified. You cannot use free text concepts as dimensions. You can not. Um, on attributes, there is no such restriction. They can use a code list, they can use a formatted value, they can use free text, depending on how you define them when you design your data structure. Just to be clear, all of this is determined when you are designing your data structure, your data structure definition. So when you design your DSD, you say that this is a concept, um, footnote, it's an attribute, and it's free text. And then when you transmit the data, you can transmit anything you like. Or you can also specify this is an attribute unit multiplier, this is the code list that it's using. And then when you transmit the data, just like with a dimension, you must use a valid code for that concept. And if you use an invalid code, even though it's an attribute, it will still generate an error. It will make the data set invalid. Is this clear? Any questions? So, let's have a look at our data model again. So we have concept indicator, its ID is indicator, row is dimension, and for indicator, we always use a code. Pretty much. For reference area, we have the ID ref on this for area, it's a dimension. CL area is our representation, focus. Time period, ID is time on this code period. It's a dimension. Time period is always formatted. It's one of those, one of those concepts which are always formatted. You don't use the code list for time, time period. Unit multiplier, it's an attribute. It's attached to the time series, and it uses for the CL unit model. And finally, we have observation value. 
concept that you obvious in the school vacuum, which is a primary measure. And it's type floating point out. Any questions? No questions? Let's go. So we have cross domain, we discussed cross domain concepts. And aside from those, we also have cross domain contests. So just like cross domain concepts is basically it's a list of standard concepts. Cross domain code list represent standard code lists. Um, they are also developed by the SDMX statistical uh, working group. When the SWG, the statistical working group, develops uh, cross domain code lists, as much as possible, it tries to uh, base them on existing classifications. Uh, otherwise, it creates their its own codes. Whenever you establish data exchange, once again, you should look at the available cross-domain code lists and use them as much as possible. It makes your job easier. If you design your own data structure definition, which has concept sets, right? You don't need to figure out whether M is male or one is male and F is female or two is female or maybe it's something else, or maybe it's MLFM or whatever. All you have to do is go to the SDMX global registry, which we'll look at uh, in one of the exercises or several of the exercises. Look up the cross domain code list, download it and use it in your own system. And then, if it doesn't have all the codes that you need, you can take ownership of that uh, code list and extend it. Add the codes that you need. And if it doesn't have all the languages that you need, which it definitely won't because it's all English at the global registry, then you can download the code list and add the names in your language. This is all perfectly fine. Just use the codes which are already there. It's good for you because it makes your data more interoperable. Don't you invent the wheel. Use what's available as much as possible. And if it doesn't, if you can't find what you need, then um, add the codes that you do need. But as much as possible, this is it. Now. In, if memory serves, July 2020, the Statistical Working Group published um, a code list for degree of urbanization. So it has various, it more than, it has several codes. related to the uh, degree of urbanization, including urban, rural, semi-dense town, rural area, and so on. So that code list was published in 2020. Why? You know why it was only published two years ago? It's not because of SDMX. It's because it took statisticians 70 years to agree on that code list, to agree to decide what is <coughs> urban, what is rural, what is a semi-dense town, and so on and so forth. All this time, for decades, the decisions from various countries could not agree on a classification of urban rural location. It was only in 2020 that the Statistical US Statistical Commission accepted the recommendation for such a code list which is a major issue. And as soon as such classification was adopted, 
immediately the statistical working group created a code list based on that classification and published it at the global level. <coughs> which goes to say that if now you are creating a data structure which has a breakdown by urban rural location, don't create your own codes, go to the global registry, use that code list. It's much easier and it makes your data more interoperable. And sometimes, of course, quite often, you will not find that code list because you don't have cross-domain code list for every concept. It's work in progress. For example, in the case of the SDGs, data structure definition, which was developed before the uh, degree of urbanization code was published, which uses different codes. Which is not good, but well, that's like things that in SDGs. So here you have some examples of cross-domain concepts and cross-domain code lists that can be used to represent those concepts. Concept sex, code list scale sex. Concept unit model, code list CLB. This is also important because these are some standard recommended codes. So before that we were talking about recommended concepts and recommended code lists. And these are recommended codes. So whenever you create your own code list, for which you cannot find a cross code list, happens all the time. Please use underscore T for total. Always use underscore T for total. Again, it makes your data more interoperable. Unknown, use underscore X. Unspecif uh, uh, sorry, you underscore U. Unspecified, use underscore X. Not applicable, use underscore Z. Okay? And if you are extending a global code list, then you can use underscore L. You can also use it. And we'll cover that in more detail. Uh, So let's have a look at our data model. We have a code list CL indicator. At this time, it only has one code because we haven't seen other pages in the yearbook, other publications. CL unit mult. This is a cross domain code list. And it uses Z for uh, unit, uh, sorry, zero for units, one for tens, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions. Uh, this is the standard representation of unit multiplier in SDMX. Um, the code corresponds to the power of 10 associated with the unit multiplier. So 10 to the power of 3 is thousands, so unit multiplier 3 is used. For millions, the power of 10 is 6, for billions, 9, and so on. Any questions? No questions, I think. Question? And so let's have a look at what we have created. And now we'll look at the things in perspective. Remember concept scheme? This is our concept scheme. This is what it looks like. Concept ID and name, ID and name, ID and name, ID and name, ID and name. This is the concepts that we have. Then we also have the code lists. They're not shown here, but we have a code list CL indicator, CL area, CL unit model. In this middle part, is the data structure definition. So the DSD in pure terms, it does not include the concept scheme or progress. It references them. So we have a data structure definition that says, I use a concept ID from concept scheme, 
such and such. This concept is a dimension and it uses CL indicator as its representation. Okay? So, when you create a data structure, we specify concepts, we specify the role, whether it's a dimension or attribute or primary measure, and you specify its representation. That's what you do. But indicators, they are, uh, sorry, uh, code lists, they are defined separately, and the concept scheme is defined separately. Any questions? Yes. Uh, in the slide, generally cost more domain code. If, if I cannot uh, fill the, the code, we use the, the order. Uh, the question was, have a code underscore or other? So, which means that if I can't find which codes to use, I use underscore all. Is that correct? Um, in principle, yes, but it depends on your data structure. It depends on what on whether you want to allow that. Because um, in many cases, you don't want to put other in your code list because you want the person to specify exactly what the specific code code. So for example, if you are creating a reference area code list for Thailand, and you create a list of Thailand provinces or cities, Bangkok, Pattaya, or for, let's say these provinces, Thailand provinces, maybe you don't want to include underscore or in that code list. You don't want to say someone to report my province is Ada. No, there's no Ada. There are only so many provinces, and you must use one of these codes. But in other cases, when you are dealing with indicators based on censuses or surveys, then the underlying um, instrument, census or surveys, may have used other as an option to the question. In that case, you may. Sometimes you may want to put it on your page. So it depends. And again, these are just recommended codes. You don't have to include all of them in your code list. And typically you don't include all of them in your code list. But if your code list has a code for total, then please use underscore T. If your code list has not applicable, please use underscore Z. It's easier for everyone to understand this, um, to understand this. Now, data model or the data structure definition defines what data can be and how the data can be encoded and transmitted, and flows in a data structure definition. They can have adverse impact on data. If you find yourself in a situation where you have missing concepts, incorrect role of concepts, or an optimized model, then it doesn't mean that you won't be able to use your DSD. It just means that um, it will be more difficult to use. And uh, that is what makes designing the data, a data structure definition so complex. Because when you are designing your DSD, typically you don't have the complete information about your data. And decisions that you make um, later on during the data exchange may prove, it may turn out that maybe you, may, uh, you could have made a <coughs> better decision. And that happens all the time. But this is also why, especially when you are designing a DSD for data exchange, you don't design it by yourself. You need to bring together the stakeholders. You need to create a working group, typically. 
composed of people who will report to the Navy in the future. And you work with them to ensure that their needs are met. And that should use the chances of close the Navy construction. All right, so we've talked about, I've mentioned data set several times, but what is this? This is the formal definition. Organized collection of data defined by a data structure definition. Do you know what this what the keyword here? The keyword is A. A data structure definition. What it means is that if you have an SDMX data set, it means that it has data structured in accordance with one and only one data structure definition. You can have data from many DSDs, which you can't mix them in the same data set. A data set always can only contains data structured in accordance with one data structure definition period. So you've got to remember that. If you have data from three DSDs, they need to be put into three data sets. Then you can bring those data sets together in your analytical tools. You can cross-reference them, you can combine them in your applications, but transmission or dissemination for SDMX, each data set must be structured in accordance with one DSD. Now, something else we should have mentioned is time series. What is a time series? A set of observations of a particular variable taking at different points in time. Observations that belong to the same time series, they only differ in their time dimension. All the other dimensions are identical. So, if you have a time series like <coughs> GDP of Thailand, is it in a time series? Yes. And then you will have values for 2010, 2011, and so on and so on, 2021, 2022. So if you look at that time series, you'll see that, um, and again, obviously it has to be GDP, let's say, income. Then the dimensions are always the same. The indicator is the same GDP. The reference area is the same. Uh, the only thing that is different between the figures is the time, which is 2010, 2012, 